Hola mi gente. Welcome to another episode of the Wine and Chisme podcast. A podcast created to amplify voices and share stories of people from marginalized and communities of color doing remarkable things. All while sipping on a glass of wine. I'm your host, Jessica Yanez. In today's episode, I get to speak with Yael Rosenstock Gonzalez. Yael is a sexologist and the founder of Kaleidoscope Vibrations, a company dedicated to supporting and creating spaces for individuals to explore and find community in their personal identities. As a queer, polyamorous, white-presenting New Yorkian Jew, Yael has always been interested in understanding the multi-level experiences of individuals. Through her company, she facilitates workshops, develops curriculum, offers identity exploration coaching, and publishes narratives often left out of mainstream publishing. There is adult subject matter in this episode and some discussion of events that could be triggering, so I want to make sure I advise you of that before we dive in. So grab your glass of wine and join us for the chisme. Welcome, welcome, mi gente. Today, I am super excited. I have Yael Rosenstock gonzalez Hi, Yael. Hi. I am so excited to have you here. As soon as you told me what you do, I was like, get this girl scheduled ASAP. <laughs> and, to hear. Oh my gosh, I can't wait for everybody else to hear what you do. Before we get to the chisme... We always talk about the wine. So I had a poll on Instagram because in San Diego, it's 10 a.m. And obviously over there, it's 1 p.m. in Indiana. Yes. So I had a poll as if I should still drink wine at 10 a.m. And I got a 100% like, duh, it's who you are. 100%. So uh, the wine I'm drinking is Adalina Bodegas. It's a Verdejo 2018. It is a wine. It's a Spain Spanish white wine. So, but you, what are you, tell us what you're drinking over there. <laughs> I am drinking the ever fancy hot water. That is literally what I'm drinking right now. And I will be moving on to something a little bit fancier, which is Dominican tea, which has jengibre and lemon and miel and manzana. Like, so I will be going into a route, but right now I'm just trying to keep my throat warm. <laughs> okay. Well, while you were saying that, I took a drink of this and I think I have a new favorite white wine. I'm not going to lie. Ooh. I got it at Trader Joe's. I think it was like seven nine. I get so many wines from Trader Joe's. I swear. I think I need them to sponsor me, but because they just have so many different types of wine and the price yeah. point are really good, but this is really good because I was reading the back and it says clean and bright opening notes of green herbs, lime, fennel, and grass with subtle hint of peach and lavender, which I told, as soon as it said lime and fennel I was in and once I've taken a drink of it it's really good it's not sweet I don't I'm not a big sweet wine person it's really great it's like a perfect like warm day summer wine so I think I just found a new favorite white wine excellent yay very nice so now that we've gotten to the wine or my wine (laughs) (laughs) we can get to the chisme so you identify as a Jewish New Yorican. Yes. And can for those you, who don't know what New Yorican is, I'm a Puerto Rican New Yorker. Yes. So can you tell <laughs> me how those two cultures came together growing up? Were there any major con- contrasts that made it? I mean, I would imagine there would be some pretty major contrasts, but I'm not Jewish, nor am I Puerto Rican. I'm uh, California born, Latina, Chicana, Mexican, you know, wherever, however you want to identify. Um, can you tell me like what those, how those cultures came together in New York? Yeah. So my mother is um, a Puerto Rican Catholic. She was in PR until she was 12 and then she came to New York. And my father was born in Israel, but moved here, moved to the States when he was three. Oh, wow. So he's and- like legit. He wasn't even just like generational, not from Israel. That's crazy. Well, realistically, he is a Brooklynite, right? Like that's where he lived all his life. And his mother was from the U.S. His father was from Frankfurt, Germany and had fled the Holocaust. Um, So they met in New York City 
and they were actually like best friends for a while, like telling people, telling each other where to go out and who to date and stuff. And then they realized they liked each other. Um, and they, you know, they ended up deciding to have me, but they had to figure out what that would look like in a Puerto Rican Catholic and Jewish household. They're, they're super cute, and they realized that, I mean, my, my father really wanted to raise Jewish kids. My mother really loves Jesus. But the way that they came to an agreement was that we would have Jewish names, but we could not be kosher. Because my mom's like, I'm not taking my kids to Puerto Rico or Spain and saying that my kids can't have pork or seafood. So we, we were raised in like a, we celebrated the Jewish holidays, we celebrated the Christian holidays. Our Jewish holidays were full of like Spanish because it was full of Ecuadorians and Puerto Ricans and, and Jews. And it's just a really beautiful mixture of cultures that was, I don't think, at least from my perspective, ever in contradiction because we hold the same values. We just practice our religions differently. And I didn't feel like there was any conflict. Wow, that would, that's really cool. I mean, just because you would think from the outside, that's why I had to ask the question, because from the outside, you would think there's like conf- like definitely values, but there would be conflicting cultures. So to see that they were able to navigate that, that's really awesome. I do want to ask about your journey, but in order to talk about your journey, I want to talk about how you describe yourself and where you are now. You describe yourself as queer and polyamorous. Um, is, is sexuality something that you ever discussed at home? What was your parents' view of sexuality? Because I would think that those, that might be a culture clash as well. Yeah. So my dad founded Queens Theater in the Park, which was a theater, uh, a live theater in New York City, uh, in Queens. And as is fairly stereotypical, there are a lot of gay folks in theater, right? right? Like that's just a thing. Um, so I grew up where almost all of my quote unquote uncles were gay men. Like I, I didn't know many lesbians. I didn't know any queer people, but I knew a lot of gay men. So to me, I had an assumption kind of in my head. I was like, my, my world was different than everyone else's world. My world was very colorful. There are different races and religions and cultures. And I just thought most white men were gay. Uh, (laughs) The non-white men in my, in my life were not gay but the white men were. So I was just like, oh, white men are gay. That's a thing. Except for my dad. <laughs> or or there were predators, because I saw in the news that there were white predators. And I was like, oh, older white men, if they're not gay, are dangerous. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, isn't that crazy how certain things just completely just color our vision, right? But I would say, um, I and I've been working through this, when... I, it took a long time for me to come out as queer because I didn't feel like I was queer enough. I had only experiences with men and I didn't know what counted as being attracted to other genders. And so it, it, it took a lot. Every year I'd have the same conversation with friends like, oh, I, I never identified necessarily as fully straight, kind of like 80%. And and as I've gotten older, that shifts a little bit. But when I quote unquote came out, right, when I started talking about this, um, from my mother's side, there was a like there was some tension because she totally thinks it's valid to be a lesbian or to be gay, but she didn't understand, which I don't think is unusual in the Latin community, queerness. Well, that either. actually like, is perfect for my next question because it was really, to me, I think, and I think even to me, sometimes it's a little bit confusing in regards to what queer means and what bisexuality means. Can you kind of help clarify what, you know, is it the same thing? Are they different? How, in regards to how, like how people view those or see themselves or, or is it, or is it just dependent on how people see themselves? Uh, All of the above. So (laughs) bisexual literally just means that you are attracted to two or more genders, which means that it's quite similar to queer or pan. So pansexual is how I also identify, which is attraction to people as opposed to a gender. And so whatever their gender might be is irrelevant. But I think bi- bisexuals often assumed to be attraction to two genders. And so people are fearful of being associated with the, the idea that there's only two genders instead of recognizing all the genders that we have. And queer is really just, I'm not straight. It can mean almost anything. Um, and But for most, like when someone says they're queer, they're not actually telling you who they have sex with or who they're romantically attracted to. They're just saying, I'm not, some of them are just saying, I'm not straight. And does that mean like just attraction wise or sex wise, or is it both or is it either? So queer is an umbrella term across the spectrum. So it can be, this is, I'm romantically attracted to 
more than whatever is quote unquote the opposite gender. It can be I'm sexually attracted to more than that. And if it's used as gender, it means that you are not what's called a cis person. Okay. And a cis person is like, when you're born, they say, it's a boy. And today you're like, I'm a boy. That's a cis person. Gotcha. So anyone who says they're queer gendered means that they're not that. They're not cis. Oh my, thank you so much for clarifying. Because I, ha- I that particular term I really hadn't heard. So it's good to know. Yeah. And I think, especially for the audience who, who listens, which is probably probably a primarily Latinx audience, it's good to be able to, you know, help educate on that. I mean, I'm getting educated myself, even 10, not even five minutes into the interview. So (laughs) it's really awesome. You're really quite involved in human rights at a really young age. You were a teen peer reproductive rights educator when you were only 15 years old with the New York Civil, Civil Liberties Union how in the heck did that happen? And how did you get involved so young? Yeah, I try and think about that. Um, in high school, we had what was called a spark office. And there was basically a counselor in there four days a week who was really awesome. He was great to speak with, had lots of resources. And I think he pulled me aside one day and said, hey, I heard about this internship. Why don't you apply? I don't know why he invited me to apply to this internship, but it was Super cool. It was downtown Manhattan. The interview involved me role playing being a gay man telling my partner that I had given him herpes because I had cheated on him. And like, this was how they were interviewing us, right? Like, how do we handle this role? I mean, they had other questions and right. what have you, but like, I had never been to an interview where I was acting as part of it. And I, I really loved it. And it was a beautiful space where. They brought in speakers and like product folks, and they really taught us so much about consent and reproductive justice and access. And so our jobs were to, we were 15 to 17, and we were talking to, let's say, like 11 to 14-year-olds about their options. And in New York State, anyone has access to reproductive rights. There is no age requirement. So unlike if everything else in health, an 11 or 12-year-old has full access to abortion access or birth control or what have you. And it it just felt right. It felt right that we were getting getting this information to young people because some of them were having sex and they didn't necessarily have the information to do it in a safe way. It almost reminds me of, um, I mean, not having that access and not being safe reminds me of the movie Kids. I don't know it. You've never seen Kids? Okay, so Kids is a movie that has Chloe Sevigny and Rosario Dawson. Um, This is like 90s around and... It's this group of New York kids who are just very street, like they're just very street kids. And there's this one boy who says he only has sex with virgins, but at one, but he's passing along HIV because at one point somebody obviously wasn't a virgin or something happened, but he like gives Chloe and then Chloe seven years a virgin. She has sex with him. And then Rosario Dawson is a very permit, you know, her character is more promiscuous and they go to the clinic and Chloe seven years character has HIV while Rosario Dawson doesn't. So it's this story about how she's trying to find the guy to tell him that. And in the meantime, he's still having sex with other young girls And then she gets drunk at a party and some guys having like passed out, some guys having sex with her, another teenager and how it's, it's kind of, it's this crazy thing of when you don't know how scary things are when you don't know, which so plays into what's happening right now, even in a totally different way of why it's so important to, you know, if you're not feeling good to go to go get a test or if you're not like to in, in regards to sexuality and to sex, like if you are being sexually active every six months to get tested and yes, you know, sure. all of those things. So, Oh my gosh, you have to watch this movie for sure. You have yeah, to watch I'll put it, it on my list, but also there's this misinformation out there, right? Like sleeping with virgins is how some cultures, like the narrative that some cultures have offered to cure HIV. Are you and serious? It 100% does not cure HIV. It just passes it on. But there's, there's this a belief in certain spaces that if you have sex with a virgin, you will be cured. And so it, it's an awful way that's passing HIV on to new, to new folks. Oh, my gosh. So how do you think sexuality played in your youth? Because is it something that you, you are 15 and you get this really 
ac- this access to probably something that a lot of kids don't get access to in regards to mm-hmm. being this, um, you know, having this internship. How did this affect, you know, when you would go back to school or is this something you would just even talk to your friends about? How was this per- even perceived at home? I mean, obviously with your dad working and where he did, I would assume that it was more of an open environment. But what about on your mom's side? How was that? Or was she as open with that as yeah. well? So, like I said, the, the thing that she's less open about is the bisexuality type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to sex, it was really apparently around 10 or 11, we were in the car and I was like, mom, can we talk about something that isn't sex? (laughs) (laughs) She made it her mission to inform us as much as possible. Like if I had, I remember a friend asked me about oral sex in middle school and I didn't know the answer. So I went, mom, what's oral sex? And like, what, what do you do? And so she told me, and I went back to school at 11 or 12 and I told my friend, this is what oral sex is. Right. And so she never hid anything. She believed that information was important. She never said, wait till marriage. What she said was sex is a beautiful and pleasurable experience when you have it with someone that you really care about and love and that that's sacred. And, you know, so it was very sex positive, not promiscuous positive, but (laughs) sex positive. Um, So, and they, and they both are pro choice, right? And so they didn't have any issue with the idea of me working with this organization They've always been supportive. I, I already had a job by that point. I was working full time over the summers, um, so I, th- there was no, there were no issues there. And sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> no, just in regards to like, be, how did it affect your oh, like cool. your yeah your view and just in, of yourself are obviously, and then when you yeah. would go to school and even how did it affect your relationships with you know other kids your age going through all of that. So this came at a really convenient time. I had just ended with a toxic relationship where I was being emotionally and psychologically abused and had experienced non-consensual sexual activity. And despite the supportive and loving environment that I came from, despite my own like general good self-esteem, like this, this still occurred, right? Because it can always still occur. And so this was an opportunity for me to create a new group of friends who weren't in this tiny little school where everyone knew what had gone on. And it it really opened up a space for me. But it also, like, I would come back to school with tons of condoms because we didn't have, like, the New York City, the cheap condoms. We had, like, really awesome condoms (laughs) that came from all these different places, different sizes, different colors. And so I knew that there were people having sex that without barriers and so I would make them little condom packets and be like oh here's some condoms for you because I heard you talking about going bareback (laughs) (laughs) and I do think I heard that there might have been some rumors about me being a slut which seemed a little bit odd given that I was handing out condoms as opposed to using them for myself but I I think overall that that environment made me feel really good it made me feel validated and it helped me step into healthier relationships afterwards where I felt more comfortable setting my boundaries and recognizing how to proceed in a way that was safe and comfortable and emotionally good. But I don't, I, overall, I don't think it affected so much in school. It didn't propel me to be more sexual. I, I was already a sexual being. It was just helpful in making sure it was on my terms. Being able to do that at such a young age, I think obviously, like you said, was helpful because it helps you recognize. What do you think that there's so many issues and and so many things in regards to people with where should sex and sexuality be taught? Should it be taught in school? Mm -hmm. Should it be taught at home? Should it be how I remember my mom talking to me about sex at a relatively young age, not in graphic detail, not in anything like that, but just kind of in generals. But what, at what point do you feel like those dialogues need to be open to be able to, so your children are able to have a, a healthy view of sex and not feel, and not feel ashamed. But I think that is a whole other layer, layer of feeling ashamed that's brought in by religion. And we can talk about that yes. later, but um, just in regards to having kids start having a healthy view of their body and a healthy view of uh-huh. sex to help them avoid some of these traps that can, if you don't know, you can get put into. 
So I don't have kids, but I have worked with a lot of kids, some specifically around this topic. But when I was babysitting and nannying for infants and for babies, um, in particular, there was one little girl that I took care of for months and months of her life. I, while changing her diaper, and you know, because babies will reach into their own diapers and reach in to touch their bodies, I'd be like, oh, that's your vulva. That's your, you know, like you're touching your vulva, your lips. Um, and I'd explain to her, you can touch them once I've wiped everything clean, right? Because you don't want to touch caca. <laughs> so even at like, let's say 10 months old, before she's speaking, before she's walking, I was letting her know these are your body parts. It is okay to touch them. There's nothing wrong with you touching them. Just don't put caca in it because then you're going to get an infection. So just touch it once there's no more mess. And how were the parents, how did the parents feel about that? Or did they know or how, what was the the mother has no problem with that. The mother is on board with that kind of language, but there's actually a mother who wrote a blog called we don't touch our vulvas at the dinner table. Um, And just to be clear, vulva is the part that you can see. So a vagina is the inside, like the birth canal, but the part with the lips and the clitoris, that's the vulva. And so this mother, her three-year-old was masturbating And she taught her three-year-old that you can masturbate in the bedroom, you can masturbate in the bathroom, but we don't touch ourselves at the dinner table. And so it's a very, like, shame-free space. It's not saying that there's anything wrong with what you're doing, but that certain activities have certain spaces. And we also know that there are babies in utero, right? So, like, while you're still pregnant, if you have a baby with a vulva, they can be rocking on their, you know, they can be touching themselves. Babies with vulvas who are born will go onto their heels, They'll put their heel against their clitoris and rock themselves. So masturbation and sexual exploration is completely normal across the developmental stages. So we need to make sure that kids don't feel wrong about touching themselves or being pleasurable as long as they recognize that, you know, you have, you can't do it in front of other people without asking permission because that's consent boundaries are being broken. Right. No, I I had a friend who her she had, she's a teacher And she had a child, and this was like in elementary school, who would find like a table corner or something like that, like the leg of a table, and start rubbing herself against it. Because obviously when, as just humans, right, we find something that's pleasurable, we want to do it over and over. And if we're not, if you're not, if you're told it's bad, then that's where some shame starts to of starts course. to form. But if you think that's so great when you're being told like, that's fine, but this is not where we do it. This is not the space you do it. This is not the space you do it. You do it here, here, because obviously you don't want to raise a child who's like masturbating in public. <laughs> no, because that's not consensual to anyone else. <laughs> right. And I think that's the that's the important part is talking about consent because just because you consent for yourself, that doesn't mean everybody else wants to see that or gives their exactly. consent. So I think that's a really good point you made. And in schools, including nursery and daycare, it's such a simple thing to teach children to respect each other's bodily autonomy, right? So if you want to hold, you know, Sada's hand, that you say, Sara, I want to hold your hand. Can we hold hands? Uh, Ernesto, let's let's go. Can I play with your hair? Jackie, like, you know, whatever. So you ask the kid permission. You teach them to ask permission. And that teaches them that it's important to not touch someone without their consent. You know, and it's, you don't need to have a sexual conversation. You're just having a, a respect conversation. Right. Um, I want to talk about, you had said that you had been... You're a survivor of sexual violence Mm -hmm. from when you're younger. I am as well. When I was 19, I was sexually assaulted. How do you think that changes? And maybe we can only speak for our own, but you have, you know, you have a master's, you're working on your PhD on all of these types of things. How do you think what a survivor of sexual assault, it changes their view of sex and sexuality? So I mean, there's a lot of studies on this kind of stuff. It really varies person to person insofar as how they engage. There are some people who, after sexual assault, um, almost become, and not actually asexual, but that they, they disengage from sex and sexuality. They don't feel safe um, doing anything, even though, right, a sexual assault isn't sex. It's just violence. It's, it, you know, a lot, so there are plenty of people who their first experience of penetration was a rape. 
And so they think of having lost their virginity through rape and it's, that wasn't sex, right? That was violence. It was violence that was done to a particular part of you. But there are other people who seek to take control of their sex and their sexuality. And so they'll become more sexually active and engage in lots of sexual partners to, to regain a sense of control over their bodies and themselves. In my case, I became very controlling and that uh, if anyone tried to make a move, I became petrified and they would become very scary. Like their faces would become grotesque. I, I didn't want to look at them or see them ever again. And so it, in order for me to engage sexually with someone, I needed to know that I was making the decisions, that I was leading the time frame, and that they weren't trying to pressure me in any way. Because if they did, I'd leave. Mm -hmm. I became the, I didn't become the closed off. I was definitely the opposite in my experience of taking control of how that was going to happen and who it was going to happen with and everything. And it's still like, you know, certain things are still very triggering. When I hear a certain song, it's very triggering because it happened during a certain song. Yeah, that's um, totally normal. And this is, you know, over 20 years ago now. Um, people don't realize that it can, it still has an effect. It still has yeah. this everlasting thing where I, a song that I used to absolutely love, I can't stand anymore. Were you able to talk about that? Like I, my parents know, but we've never really truly discussed it there there's certain things that are very that they still hold very traditional I think that whole like okay well it happened now let's we don't need to talk about it anymore why are you bringing it up that's still very much prevalent in my immediate family so we've never like truly discussed it they've never asked me about it they've never and how was your experience with your parents when that when you went through all of that I would say we never truly discussed it. It happened with someone I was in love with, um, that I loved very much, that they knew that they liked very much. And I think that in general, they have a problem associating those kinds of negative things with people that they've liked. And yeah, and I, I don't necessarily know that I wasn't like believed, but that it wasn't, I don't feel like I was taken that seriously. And when something ha similar happened to someone else that I love, I think at that point, because it was like 10 years later, it was easier for them to understand and recognize it as a problem, as violence and as abuse. But I think at the time it wasn't. And I actually, in my book, I write about the triggers that can happen, right? That like even 15 years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, I imagine 40 years later, certain things can bring your brain back to something that's very scary. And, uh, because I've had that experience in the book, I, I try and give people like a guide for how to handle it, right? Like if you are the one experiencing a flashback and you are able, just let the person know I'm experiencing a flashback and I need you to back off. I need you to hug me. I need you to whatever. Ideally, maybe tell them ahead of time that this could happen to you and how you'd like for them to proceed. And if you're someone witnessing this, to just wait and not assume that you've done something wrong necessarily. You may have, but you may have also just, it's an un- you know, it wasn't you, it was the past and the past feels very real in a flashback. And so, yeah, I think it's important to talk about that when having sexual encounters beforehand. So people feel ready to handle what is a very scary situation. Yeah. I think sometimes it's even, even when you do talk about it, it's sometimes hard because I know that the, you know, there have been very few men that I've really wanted, that I've cared about, that I've wanted to discuss this with just to let them know, look, this is something that happened to me. Yeah. And nobody ever taught me that. For some reason, I just like, that was kind of, I'm a very big, I'm a big communicator. So mm -hmm. that was something. And I want to make sure you never played this song ever around me. The song is Hotel California, by the way. So if anybody knows oh. me, like I used to love that song. So if anybody's here around me and that song comes on, I like, tense up really bad. I could become quiet. I walk away. Like if I'm able to walk away, I walk away. Yeah. If we're in the car, I'm like, change the channel. Like, because it just like, you can, I'm sure you can even see me like the reaction that yeah. I'm having right now, just talking yeah. about that because that used to be such like a great song for me. And now it's just, just it's terrible triggering. pain. Yeah. And I think even sometimes it's very hard for the other person to, to discuss or to, um, take in because it's a, it can be a very, very traumatic experience. I mean, 
it's a very traumatic experience. Not can be. It's a very traumatic experience when you go through something like that. So, so I'm getting all like, oh, so I'm sending you a high five. Thank you, thank you. And uh, sorry, okay, I need to like regroup for a minute. Yeah, of course. So, um, you also you were talking a little bit. Or you, when I was reading some of your stuff, you also talk about intersectionality and everything. I'm not quite sure what that really means. I think I have an idea, but if you can kind of discuss like really kind of what intersectionality means for myself and maybe for other people who aren't quite aware of what that means. So I'll start with the general definition, but then we can do it Latina style. Um, So intersectionality is coined as a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, and she used it to describe the unique experiences, particularly of black women. Right. So we know that there's experiences that black men are experiencing as black men. We know there are experiences that women and generally the majority group would be considered the white women group. Right. As women. So like sexism and racism. But rarely do we talk about like for people experiencing both sexism and racism. And that's different than either of those things individually. And it's not just like one plus one equals two. It's a unique combination. And so even when you think about when we just celebrated a hundred years since women got the vote, we just celebrated a hundred years since white women got the vote. I was about to speak. Black women still didn't have the vote for a long time. Latinas who did not speak English were barred from voting because of the language requirements, right? I think until like the 1960s. And so it's definitely not been a hundred years for Latinas or Chinese women or Asian women in general who didn't speak English. And so that's intersectionality, right? Recognizing the ways that our different identities lead to experiences that are unique from other people who share parts of our identities, but not all of them. And so for Latinas, language is a big part of our intersectional identity. Um, And then cultural, because so many of us do in fact have strong roots to either the countries of our parents, ourselves, or our grandparents, right? Those things like religion and its place in sexuality and shame can be an additional barrier to, let's say, sexual freedom. I have everything. I'm like, that's so good to know because it really is. <laughs> so let's talk now. Let's kind of talk about religion and sexuality, because I know that's such a, especially within the um, Latinx community, a lot of people, I was baptized Catholic, but I am not a practicing Catholic. I, call myself a non-denominational Christian, but I don't really even go to church anymore because of, because of a lot of this stuff, right? Because yeah. you're, because of the shame that is imposed, not necessarily by God or the universe or whatever you want to talk, but what is imposed by man interpreting those words. So how do you feel that's played? I mean, obviously it's paid, played a large part. How do you feel like people can work in those two worlds without feeling shame? How do you get past the religion part and the shame that you're being talked into basically, right? Because if nobody tells you it's shameful, you don't know, you wouldn't think anything else. So how do you feel, or how do you feel people can work kind of through that and beyond that? So I think for a lot of people, it's recognizing that the upbringing of sexuality within religion has been traumatic. Um, And so you're, you're healing from trauma. And so it's not just like, Oh, I learned this thing. I was taught this thing. You've internalized that pleasure is wrong. And so if you've internalized that, it takes a lot of unlearning to be able to not just experience pleasure, but experience pleasure without feeling like you're a bad person or that you have, done something wrong against God or Jesus or whatever deity that you believe is somehow shaming you for those experiences. I think it was really helpful. And I'm not Christian, right? I'm Jewish, but like, look at Jesus's teachings and like who he hung out with and what he believed was actually worthwhile. Right? Like he didn't care about people engaging in sex work. That wasn't something that was on his mind. What was on his mind were people who were rich and they didn't give to the poor. That's what bothered him because that was an actual problem. You know, how people in poverty... Sounds very familiar. Out of poverty, (laughs) like, that was not a concern for the, quote, you know, the the person who's considered the the son of God. And so if if Jesus didn't mind those things, and that wasn't his problem or what he wasn't concerned around, 
and you love Jesus and you want to be good under that faith, then stop listening to sex negative pastors or preachers and start reading the actual text and what it is that Jesus cared about. And I think that that can be really healing, doing your own Bible work. Um, in Judaism, it's really easy to find text. And, you know, Christians use our books too, right? Because we have what's called, for Christians, the Old Testament, for us, the Torah, that there's plenty of examples of positivity there or ways to interpret the words that are not meant to be shaming. And in Islam as well, um, Muhammad, uh, ha sorry, Prophet Muhammad has a lot of examples of, of not shaming women and respecting women and seeing them as equals, but the way that religion is carried out by individuals seems to give a counter narrative. Yeah. I mean, even if you look in the Old Testament and you have all of these people who have concubines and they're like, mm -hmm. they're spreading, you know, it's about quote unquote spreading their seed, but it's always seems to be like very sex positive for the male and becomes a yeah. negative. But then you look at somebody like Sarah, who she never thought, is it Sarah or Rebecca? All of a sudden I'm just blanking who she never thought she was going to have children. And mm -hmm. she gave her, her woman that she who helped her to her husband yes. in order to have a child so yes. it's like it wasn't even a shameful thing it was like this is what we do this is just how it is and now we turn this into like this really horrible thing and I've become more spiritual versus just an actual practicing religion type of person uh, I'm the type of person who you know, in the Bible, it doesn't say you necessarily need to be in a temple to worship God. Church is wherever you have two or more people being able to share that love. So that's kind of where I'm coming from these days. But also, I think it's so important to recognize when you have been shamed, because there was times, even fully as an adult, where I was like, no, I'm not going to have sex anymore. I'm not going to have sex because we're not supposed, you know, you just... And, you, and then I yeah. would, and then I would feel so guilty. And then I would be yes. like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. And then I would be beating myself up. And then I would do it like I would, I kept repeating these same patterns until finally, I don't even, I wish I could pinpoint at what it was, but finally I was at the point where I was like, why am I beating myself up for this? If God didn't want us to have sex. He wouldn't have made it pleasurable if he didn't, because sex is not just yep. for procreating. Sex is not just like, I am a good person. I, you know, believe in these things. Like, so finally I had to come to my own realization that sex wasn't going to send me to hell. And I think that's where so many people become afraid of is that sex is going to send you to hell. No, there's so many other things that I would assume would send people to hell <laughs> way before sex. I really love there's a meme that go, that's going around something like, I would rather be excluded, and it's from heaven, right? I'd rather be excluded from heaven for who I include in life than be included in heaven for who I exclude. And that's in reference to the queer community. Yeah. But the idea that like it cannot be sinful to love, right? That, that can't be a sin. Yeah. What's sinful is to hate. What's sinful is to do harm to others, is to cause others pain. Like those are those are negative things to hoard and to to leave people hungry. Those are the kinds of things that if if you are following the values of any of the monotheistic religions and at most religions in general, that would be the concern. You having orgasms. Not so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just I mean, the, the church that I did. went to at that time even had a whole section about how you shouldn't masturbate. What had a whole section? It had a whole section of, of there was a, I forget what the actual sermon series was called. Lust. It was called Lust. And he's talking about all like uh -huh. how you shouldn't lust and everything. And he even talking about how you shouldn't even masturbate. And I'm like, yeah. how do you know what feels good or what doesn't if you don't masturbate? <laughs> like, and, and my, that's become a shameful thing too. Like, people don't want to yeah. talk about it. Me and my girlfriends will talk about it, but some of them are like, no, I don't ever. And I'm like, come on. There's just so much shame around our sexuality. The, do you think that that's, first of all, do you feel like that's changed at all? Do you feel like that's evolving? I feel like. I think it's, it's dependent upon the community and where it is that you're getting information, right? I was never. I was never taught about masturbation, um, but I was never ashamed for any part of my sexuality growing up. And I feel like I, I remember working with a young student of mine 
who was able to engage in sexual activity with a partner, but masturbation was, it was really triggering for her, right? The idea that there was something wrong and dirty about her. And it took for a a long time of self-training for her to be able to reach orgasm through masturbation because there was so much shame attached to it. And to her, it was like this breakthrough, right? And that, that process again of healing, there's someone on Instagram, I think at rebel faith, who is a Christian pastor and she, um, she offers like spaces and guides for how to heal through this. And I'm happy to send you that information. Yes. That'd be awesome. I do. Yeah. I think we're talking about masturbation more, which is great. And we're having conversations about young people with vaginas and vulvas masturbating because before it was always like people with penises and specifically boys like are the ones who masturbate. And so I think having that conversation more is great. But I, I do think that in the Latin community, it's it's not uncommon to hear like, oh, no, I don't I don't masturbate or I didn't start masturbating until I was 20, you know, because that's when I realized it was a thing. <laughs> yeah. You've had a really interesting kind of career journey, um, just starting when you were 15 and everything. Can you kind of walk us through and how that led you to now, like figuring out really what you wanted to do within this in this space to take up this space. I think it was, it's really, when I was reading your information, I thought it was really, really interesting. And I would like to hear a little bit more of how that came about. It's funny. Cause like it now looks like this really well laid out plan. And I didn't <laughs> realize until a couple of years ago and I'm, I'm 29, right? So like maybe around 25, I was like, Oh my God, I have been in the sex world for 10 years. <laughs> um, but so the first time was that reproductive rights, And then soon after that, I started working with the Queen's Child Advocacy Center, which was for sexually abused children in Queens, New York. And then I joined um, Girls Educational Mentoring Services in New York City, which is an organization for domestically trafficked or uh, young women and people who have engaged in survival sex. So, um, you know, sex for the purposes of surviving. That was just about to ask. And was this while you were going to college as well? You were doing all of these things or were you taking breaks? So I started at 16 at the Queen's Child Advocacy Center. I convinced them to let me in because they were like, you are too young to be in this space. And my mom was like, listen, if she wants to do it, like, why stop her? So they let me volunteer. Um, And really, right, in hindsight, my work with the kids and my work with young women, um, because they were around between 14 and 24, that was that was also, I think, during high, no, maybe after after college, actually, um, was me trying to understand my own trauma. Because when people conceptualize trauma, right, a rape, um, a bomb, a natural disaster, which is different than you are assaulted by your family member for years or your, in my case, the person that that incident happened with is someone that you were still with six months later. And this was just re-triggering over and over again. And so I was really interested in potentially researching the difference between prolonged trauma and one-time trauma and like what effects that had on one's mental health. And so I was really just, I was researching me, right? Me search. I just, I wanted to understand. And then I was having, you know, I, I moved into a space where I was having positive sexual experiences. I had had started to lessen the control that I needed to have in interactions with men. And I realized I really want to be doing work that's more positive and preventative. So my work now focuses on consent, desire, pleasure. And I view all these things as tools to heal from and or prevent sexual violence from ever occurring. But the focus now is on how do we make as many experiences as possible super pleasurable and positive instead of like, how do we understand the negative? What what are the questions that you find people have most often when it comes to sex and sexuality? I don't know. I'm really bad about like polling these things. I mean, I think I've gotten a few times from people, from men from other countries, like, do women actually like sex? You know, this idea that women are non-sexual beings or that it's yes let me answer that yes yes we do (laughs) well my answer is as long as they want to be doing it and the sex is enjoyable yes exactly (laughs) yes it needs to be sent and you know there's the reports about um the orgasm gap right and the orgasm gap is that men in heterosexual coupling and sexual experiences have the highest rate of orgasm among all the parents that they sec- they checked for. So they looked at 
straight men, gay men, straight women, lesbians, and bisexuals. And bisexual women and straight women are at about 66 or 67 percent of the time we're orgasming, whereas lesbians, I think, were 86 percent of the time, and gay men were 88, whereas straight men were at 95. <laughs> and so that that serious percentage gap is telling you something, right? Like women are getting off with each other. Right? And they didn't, I don't know if they include trans folks in these studies, but women are getting off with each other and men are getting off with each other, but still lower rates than just straight men. And so what are we doing around sex? Like when someone says sex, are they thinking of penis vagina? Because that's very limiting right. in our understanding of what sexuality is. There's so many things that are involved in what sex looks like and how it can go down. So I, yeah, so there's, I think, questions around like how to make it pleasurable, I get a lot of questions around consent because people are very concerned, thankfully, about not doing harm, right? And they know that that's what I focus on is harm prevention. And so I do get a lot of those kinds of questions. And then around sexuality, people not necessarily understanding where they are. Are they enough? Are they, you know, doing it right? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, you so you've written extensively about female sexuality. Have you seen an evolution in regards to how females embrace their sexuality in the time that you've been writing and researching about it? So I wouldn't say I, I'm a newish researcher, particularly in this field, right? I have done research, but it's been focused more on youth experiences. And, and I did do some work for a couple of years around colleges and sexuality, but I wouldn't say like, that's, that's my space. And so I can't speak to like the evolution what I can say is some of the research is showing, for example, that sexual acts across the board are increasing and that, for example, anal sex, which was very unusual as an activity over the past couple of decades, hasn't really increased. And so we see that more and more people are trying anal sex. Uh, for example, choking was almost you know unheard of and now huge percentages of people are engaging in choking. And I'm currently actually doing a study with my advisor and a team where we're asking people about their choking experiences because no one else is doing this study <laughs> and we don't know how they're doing it, where they're getting this information from, why they start consent. And so, yeah, there's been an uptick in like, what are people trying? Um, but we're still trying to figure out like other pieces of it. So why do you think there's been an uptick in, do you think it's media based like movies books all these or do you think that people are more willing to talk about where do you why do you think the uptick in things that people are trying why there is an uptick in things that people are trying yeah this is just a theory but realistically i think things like 50 shades and uh whatever it's called when you take a, a regular thing and then you create your side erotica from it uh -huh. <laughs> um, those things, because that's what people are saying, right? They, they saw it on TV. They read it in this thing that they were looking at. People just talk about it. So now it's become so normalized to be engaged in certain activities. And yeah, people just recognizing that that is a thing for them. And because we're more comfortable now than we were before having these conversations, that there's more of them happening. doesn't mean that they're happening well, but <laughs> there are... <laughs> more things being discussed. So you wrote a book called An Intro Guide to Sex Positive You. What did you think was missing that you wanted to be able to share in this book? I wrote this book to my 14-year-old self, my pre- and post-sexual assault experience self. And I, I wanted to create a book. So it's divided into three sections. The first section is getting to know you. So what are your sexualities? What are your genders? And when I say sexuality, I don't just mean who you are attracted to, but what role do you take in the bedroom? And are you interested in BDSM or power play? And are you meant to be monogamous? Because it took me a long time to realize that I wasn't. And so all of these kinds of things, just really getting to know you and understanding the people around you. And the second is communication and boundary making. And that's what I really needed. I needed, I already was setting my own boundaries, but eventually I, I lost out. And I needed this kind of piece to remind me that if someone was telling me that they didn't want to respect my boundaries and that person didn't belong in my life. And that's true whether or not it's about sex, right? If people are not willing to respect your boundaries, then you need to decide whether or not you're willing to have that person in your, in your spaces. And so the second, that's all about respecting and setting boundaries. 
And the third is exploration. And so that was just like more the fun stuff, right? Like becoming intimate with yourself, loving yourself, becoming intimate with other people. What does that look like? How do you build trust? How do you build safety? And I think that this kind of, and what was missing in particular is that it's queer inclusive. I don't gender bodies. So whatever body parts you have, I do not assign them a gender. I don't say that women have vaginas because some women have vaginas, some women have penises, you know? And, and so I don't associate those things. And even though that's really simple, I, and this book was published just two years ago, I received comments from people saying it was the first time they felt validated in their sexuality and their gender while reading this kind of work because they had it before. Yeah. I think that's a huge thing because I think so many of us still are, you know, when you think of a relationship, I think of gay or straight relationships, even bi relationships and straight relationships. But then you think, there, then there's all of these other ones in between with, mm-hmm. you know, people who are trans and all of the, that. I honestly, those are not the relationships I think on a day to day basis. Um, I've met trans people. I, as far as I know, I don't have any trans friends. To me, that's not bothersome in any way. Like for the person that you are, if you're a good person, you're somebody I want in my life. If we vibe, yes. regardless of that, you're somebody I want in my life. It may not mean sexually, but it means just having you in my circle. But when you just think day to day, like relationships, you base it on your own experience and you don't think of the other experiences that other people have, other people have. So to be able to include that, I think is so empower, so empowering and powerful. You offer sex coaching as well. Yes. Um, I know you said one, like on, I went to your website and it's like one-on-one and also small groups and everything. If someone is interested in that, what should they expect? How does that work? And what do you like when somebody thinks of a sex coach, they, who knows what they're thinking, but please clarify, like what exactly does that mean? I actually just updated my survey to include what it does not include. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> um, I am someone who, and this was actually part of my sex, uh, sex professional journey is as a sex worker advocate. And I, I went out there and I spoke about this, the work, the rights of sex workers and the importance of recognizing and respecting the, the rights of folks. But I am not actually a sex worker. And so I'm not offering sex phone, phone sex. I'm not offering webcaming, right? I will be keeping my clothing on for these talks and I also will not be engaging in play. Now there's some sex therapy that you might be engaging in, you know, some role playing and what have you to help you work through whatever topics you're going through, but I'm not a therapist. And so what sex coaching basically means is I'm offering you a judgment free zone. You get to ask those questions, those things that are bothering you. You're like, is this normal? You know, how do I, how do I ask my blank that, you know, to do this? Or we're trying something new and this came up and I don't know how to react and I don't know what this means. Like, is there something wrong? Because of my personality, it often just feels like talking to a friend, right? You're talking to a friend who happens to have a lot of information about this stuff. And I I don't believe quite in giving advice. I give options. Like, oh, well, here are some things that are true for this. Like, do any of these feel good for you? And because I'm good at reading people, generally the answer is yes. (laughs) But it, it's offering those resources, that non-judgmental validation that, yes, it's totally okay for you to want this thing or to feel that thing or to be excited by that thing. Or, oh, you're trying to figure out where you fit in this realm. Like, let me tell you what different identities are that exist. Maybe one of these feels good to you and you can look it up and find community. And I think a lot of it's just validation. Ooh, well, before we go on to the questions that I asked for everybody else, and before I have you share like how people can contact you, is there anything that you want to make sure that you share, that you get across that I maybe didn't ask? I want to make sure that you have that opportunity if there's something that you're like, okay, Jessica, you didn't ask this, so let me make sure I talk about this. I want to make sure you have that. I would say that I, people are often surprised by a, what I do, how I got into it and what this all means. Cause they can't fathom the idea of someone who's a sexologist, right? Someone who studies, does research and education around sex. There are so many of us. And so what I want to put out there is that there are really great people that you can find online. And if anyone goes to my Instagram, which is the Elvis sex geek, they will see who I'm following. And I almost only follow 
sex folks. And so if you are of a specific identity, if you're looking in for people who are queer or trans or um, a certain racial group, like I'm following Muslim sex educators, I'm following Christian sex educators, Jewish sex educators, black, queer, like all the things. And so we're there. And if you're looking for a space to feel seen and heard without even having to interact, like those are great spaces to find that and to feel good. So let's make sure that we tell, so your your book is an intro guide to a sex positive you. You can find that on Amazon. I know for that for sure. Where else can you find it? Or is it just exclusively on Amazon? I mean, it's in a few bookstores, but right now the bookstores are closed. Yeah. Right. So um, let's just say Amazon is probably the best place. <laughs> um, and go ahead and what, um, go if, ahead. if you want to sign a copy, my website. Yes. Okay. And then I'll make sure to include that on the show notes, but also go ahead and um, give your website as well as your social handles again. So my Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook are all Yael, Y-A-E-L, the sex geek. Those are my sex-based handles. And then my speaking and coaching website is yaelrosenstock.com. So Y-A-E-L-R-O-S-E-N-S-T-O-C-K.com. And if you're interested in identity work in general, I have a company called Kaleidoscope Vibrations through which I do publishing. And the idea of the publishing company is to uplift narratives that are not often heard. So like one of the books is actually um, in bilingual. It's in Spanish and English. It's about a family with two daughters, one of whom has autism. And so it's just... Right, Latinas and autism, which is not, it is the first book about two little girls where one has autism and they're Latin. I love and that. It's, it's so English. needed. We, so just, I'm sorry? No, I was saying that's so needed, like that space, because obviously with everything that has recently happened within the publishing world in regards to American Dirt, um, it's really highlighted to a larger audience that the publishing space is very white dominated and a lot of people of color do not get the opportunities to be able to share their works beyond that. So, all right. So kvibrations.com is how you can find out more about that. That's awesome. Okay. So now we're on to the questions that I ask everybody. Yeah. Listen that, listen that. What do you (laughs) wish you would have known when you started out in this industry? What would I have wanted to know? I mean, in the beginning, 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 I would have wanted to read my own book. Um, (laughs) But in so far as the professional space, I actually, I think I've enjoyed the journey, right? It's, it's been really nice to learn and grow and to connect. I have been connecting with people across the board and the, the love and desire to share. So perhaps feeling the confidence to connect with folks earlier on and to not see them as these stars that are far away that I can't approach, but that people are willing and excited to help lift each other up. Awesome. What are you curious about right now? In general? Yeah, in general. I'm about to start a research, uh, hopefully about to start a research study looking at the experiences of Latinas by perceived racial categories and how they are or are not being fetishized by both partners who are and are not Latin. So to, (laughs) to make sense of all that, Right. We think of like when we talk about fetishization, we're thinking of Sofia Vegara, we're talking about Shakira, JLo, who are all almost white, right? Like this like exotic y looking idea of whiteness that fits within white beauty standards, plus has like a big butt and like a light tan. And Latinas come in so many shades and so many phenotypes. And so I want to understand what does this mean for people who are Afro Latina, who are indigenous Latina, who are white Latina. And what are their experiences and how are they being seen? And, I, and whether or not that affects their sexual desire. Ooh, that's good. I need to know more about that because <laughs> I feel like we've all had those experiences, right? Even though I'm very light complected, people always know like I'm Latina. And they're like, oh, yeah. you're Latina. Oh, da, da, da. And you're just like, oh my gosh, just stop and right that's there. <laughs> yeah. I've had a lot, I've been fetishized by Latin men because I look white. And that, like, I'm an ideal from mejorar la raza, right? Like, I look as white as you can get, and I speak Spanish, and I'm Latina. So, like, for those who are stuck into that idea of um, colorism, where there is a preference, like, that that was uncomfortable, you know? Being oh, my God. wanted because of that. Ooh, what is something that you've failed at? 
Because failure always leads to something better. We always have a learning experience. So what do you think that there's some, what is something that you feel you failed at? I mean, I feel like there's lots of little failures all the time. Um, I'm learning every time we publish a new book so much. And so I can tell you that I failed at launching my own book. (laughs) It's a great book. And I failed at making it something that was really popular because I just didn't know how. I started a publishing company because I wrote a book and I was like, cool. Um, I, I think that for me, though, I don't often see them as failures. I just see them as stepping stones on a way of getting better at something and that, that that's fine. All right. Now the fun ones, the fun questions, now that those are done. Um, what is your favorite word? Cursi. And I know what, for people who don't speak Spanish, what is cursi? It means corny. I think it's just a <laughs> cute way to say corny, cursi. <laughs> and what is a dream that scares you? A dream that scares me. Um, I, I think that, so growing up, the thing that I wanted most was to be a mother. That is something that was really, really important to me. And while I wanted to be a mother, I had 12 different ambitious, like career goals. And so I do not know where I stand right now on that. I know that my career goals are going to happen because I am ambitious, but it's, it, I don't know what my dreams are in so far as family. And so that is something that scares me, not knowing what is my ideal and what will be the right steps for me and the right choices. I understand that. And I pray it'll probably continue to change and evolve because I feel like I was the same way when I was your age. And now I'm 42 and it's totally different. So I, I totally understand that. Okay. If I'm going to go visit New York mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, yeah, where do I need to go? What do I have to have? What is your favorite hometown place and what do I need to get? I'm trying to remember the one that I said, but I'm, I have some, Oh, I know. Oh, so there's a place in forest Hills called Matisse and it's like mixed Latin cuisine and they do this phenomenal arugula salad with mango and strawberries and like feta. It is so good. It's so filling. It's so huge and it comes really pretty. But the other thing that I just thought about is on 116th street in Manhattan and Spanish Harlem, there is a place in the middle of 116th and I can't remember the crossroads, but they do a full maduro. So a sweet plantain and they fill it with carne molida, which is a uh, ground beef, Ooh. and cheese on top, and it is a buck fifty. What? The last time I was there, okay. the buck fifty for like what is a full meal? Because they got me queso and all. That is oh, a good. My. So very different from the arugula salad. But yeah, very good. but I like it. I like the the bookends of of each thing. Okay, so finally, I know you said that there was something you had specific. As far as we always end every podcast with wine, red, white, or rosé. And I know you had a a very specific kind, so please share that. Yes. And so I'm not the hugest alcoholic person, but I do like sweet things. And so there's one called, I think it's, oh, do you have that one written? Hourly? Hourly? I'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) Yeah, but it's. I don't think it's quite an ice wine, but when apparently when the grapes freeze, they become particularly sweet. And so when you make wine from that, you get this like really like deliciously, not for you because you don't like sweet, <laughs> but deliciously sweet drink. And so this one is particularly one that is like a cold grape wine. And I, yeah, I love that one. Nice. And I, Yael did send that to me. So I will make sure that I... Um, include that in the show notes. So, Yael, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and to share your experiences. This was so eye-opening and so personal as well for me. I think it's one of the most personal ones that I've I've had so far. So I really appreciate it. Um, again, all of the websites, all of the things that Yael share will be in the show notes. And until next time, mi gente, saludos. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to this podcast. 
this is definitely the most personal I've gotten in every episode. And I know sexuality and how it intersects with culture can be overwhelming, but it's imperative that we keep the dialogue open and continue to learn and grow. All the links to Yael's information will be included in the show notes, so please refer there for more information. If you are a sexual assault survivor and need someone to talk to, please call the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. Know that you are not alone and I support you. Do you have a story that needs to be told or know someone who does? Then reach out to me via my social media channels. You can reach me at at the wine and cheese man on Instagram and at the wine and cheese man podcast on Facebook and LinkedIn. I really want to hear your story. Remember, if you want to hear more wine and cheese man, please subscribe, rate, and review. Five star ratings are always appreciated, and those positive reviews are appreciated more. Until next time, mi gente, saludos.